Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Brown. I'm a consultant with CGI and I'm an adjunct instructor with the Human Computer Interaction Institute at CMU. Today I'm going to be sharing what I've learned over the last year working on a project that was supposed to protect us from hypothetical problems that might be caused by misinformation and disinformation online. The theoretical became concrete with the deadly attack on the US Capitol on January 6th. That was fueled by misinformation. As I record this session, that event is fading from memory and with it, the focus on this issue. But we need to remember, remember the attack on the Capitol and fix our fundamentally broken World Wide Web. I don't have all the answers, but I've got a couple of ideas from a project that we've codenamed Noosphere. In the first half of the 20th century, a Jesuit priest named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin envisioned an envelope of thinking substance around the earth that grows in step with the organization of the human mass. As we populate the geosphere, as we breathe the atmosphere, so we think the noosphere. He saw knowledge as a living tissue of consciousness enclosing the earth and growing ever more dense. Teilhard also talked about the mechanical apparatus of the noosphere. Quote, to an increasing extent, every machine comes into being forming a single gigantic network girdling the earth. It seems that Teilhard predicted the World Wide Web in 1947. But as the web is filled with so much misinformation and disinformation, is it really playing a constructive part in the creation of a truly collective consciousness? Misinformation expert Claire Wardle calls this one of the central challenges of our time. How can we maintain an internet with freedom of expression at the core, while also ensuring that the content that's disseminated doesn't cause irreparable harm to our democracies, our communities, and to our physical and mental well-being? The answer often is to point fingers at the users and to tell them to change their behavior. But as Don Norman said, we must design for the way people behave, not for how we wish them to behave. So I'd like to describe the way people are behaving right now, and then I'm going to talk about some principles that a solution might be based on. Here's a recommendation from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions for how to discover whether something is truthful. The recommendations are solid, but they're perhaps a little biased. The last one is that you should ask a librarian. Each of these steps takes a substantial effort, particularly when propagandists spreading malignant misinformation are actively trying to conceal their identities. Is it reasonable for us to expect that we will do this before we repost a story? We don't do that today because the majority of us believe that we can detect satire and one-sided stories and deep fakes. We believe that it's other people who need to get better at it. Also, truth isn't the primary reason why people share stories. So many users were retweeting stories that they had not yet read that Twitter recently included this new feature, which basically says, hey, you should read that story before you repost it. This has increased the amount of reading of stories 30%. Many sharers also are aware that their story is false, but still choose to share it for its identity signaling properties. Sharing misinformation is often more a performance than it's meant to be persuasive. So we're not likely to stop posting untrue stories, and we're not likely to spend time determining whether or not they're true in the first place. You might think that outsourcing that work is the answer, but most of this content doesn't even masquerade as truth. It's memes and videos and social posts that aren't exactly fake, they're just misleading. Research has shown that people reject corrections that contradict their pre-existing worldview. And there's also a backlash effect where they believe their misperceptions even more strongly as an attempt to disprove them. We know from experience around the holiday dinner table that it's no use telling crazy Uncle Larry that the moon landing was real. He'll continue to talk louder until everyone is beaten into submission over their pumpkin pie. Context, it seems, is more important than facts. 
because the most effective disinformation has always been that which has a kernel of truth to it. But the real problem is the platforms. I won't harp on this issue as we should all go watch the social dilemma from the good folks at the Center for Humane Technology. But they shout through a megaphone ideas that are barely worthy of a whisper. Their algorithms have been proven to radicalize people. They reward content creators who create extreme content and no amount of moderating is ever gonna change that. According to Facebook's internal research, our algorithms exploit the human brain's attraction to divisiveness. 64% of people who joined an extremist group on Facebook only did so because the company's algorithm recommended it to them. So according to that math, of the 3 million Facebook users who are QAnon group members, 2 million joined because Facebook recommended it. And QAnon was a key driver of the insurrection on January 6th. Also consider the scale of their influence. 70% of your time on YouTube is spent watching recommended videos amounting to 700 million hours a day. Every day, humanity as a collective spends a thousand lifetimes watching YouTube's recommended videos. And according to the former YouTube employee who built the AI, the problem is that the AI isn't built to get you what you want. It's built to get you addicted to YouTube. Recommendations were designed to waste your time. So our goal here is a, is a paradox. How might we enable moderating content without censorship? Well, Noosphere exposes a simple API for publishing, moderating, consuming, and validating trustworthy content. Any number of interfaces might exist for creating and publishing content. We picture news readers and news feeds and readers and even social media platforms being clients of this API. And Noosphere takes the moderation out of the hands of centralized platforms by baking intermediation into the protocol. It enables moderation efforts to scale and it pushes moderation to the edge. This is content that's moderated by everyone and owned by no one. So what does trustworthy mean? Technically, we're turning posts and articles into unique artifacts and making them cryptographically verifiable, just like a Bitcoin. In the same way that Bitcoin is a decentralized currency with no central bank, we propose Noosphere to be a decentralized repository of information. It's moderated by everyone and owned by no one. We'll be able to prove authenticity, meaning that everything was written by the author and published by the publisher, and also integrity, meaning that the posts have not been changed since they were published. Then the claims that are made against those artifacts, the comments and the likes, those are also cryptographically verifiable. Those are what we call trust primitives. But we're delivering an intentionally incomplete solution that can be extended by future designers. Because we're all geeks here, I'm gonna give you an example from something we can all relate to, Dungeons and Dragons. A typical creature in the game world has an alignment which broadly described its moral and personal attitudes. Alignment is a combination of two factors, one which in, identifies morality, you can be either good, evil, or neutral, and the other describes your attitude towards society in order, I call this predictability, lawful, chaotic, or neutral. Thus, nine distinct alignments can be defined by these combinations. Again, because we're all geeks here, let's think about Game of Thrones as our example. We, have, we can define everybody from Ned Stark, who's lawful good, to Joffrey Baratheon, who's chaotic evil. The great thing about knowing someone's alignment is that you can build a trust relationship if you know it. Consider Jamie Lannister. He loves Cersei, but as he comes to know her, he realizes he can't always trust Cersei, but he can always trust Cersei to be Cersei. So can we map trust to similar two dimensions as D&D's alignment? Stephen Covey, the author of The Speed of Trust, says that trust is a confidence born of two dimensions, character and competence. Character 
is built on integrity and intention. Competency is built on capabilities and results. I see these dimensions of trust being evaluated on either an individual action or on the individual themselves. For example, a key element of character is authenticity, being able to trust that the author is really the author, that at Lone Star Texan is really a person in Texas and not a Russian troll bot. Character can also be evaluated in terms of an individual post. Why is the author posting this thing now? Is it to inform us or to incite us? Similarly, competence can be evaluated in terms of track record. When this person predicts that something will happen, does it usually happen? Or competence can be evaluated on an individual post. Does the post match this person's area of, area of expertise? Now notice that at no time, I'm talking about facts checking or determining truth. All of these can be expressed by anyone in the network as a claim of trust on the individual post or the individual themselves. And what they are connoting is whether the post is likely to be trustworthy. I'll give you an example. The first known reference to the Beirut bombing being a nuclear bomb was by a CNN reporter with over 100,000 followers on Twitter. Good Lord, Lebanese media says that it's a fireworks factory. Nope, that's a mushroom cloud, that's atomic. The goal here was not to mislead us, but the reporter was a sports reporter who was speculating based on their limited knowledge. It looked like a mushroom cloud, so it must have been a nuclear bomb and therefore a terrorist attack. In the noosphere, a structured claim could be opened by anyone reading that tweet. Consider this tweet from a verified nuclear physicist saying it wasn't atomic. Notice that Chris Palmer's views were 1.1 million and the nuclear physicists were, well, we have 198 likes here. If we were able to make this post up here more trusted, then more people would see it. Incidentally, Chris was incentivized by that large number of views to tweet a second time on the topic and further spread misinformation. Another aspect of the noosphere that we're leaving unfinished is the representation of trust to the user. Here, my mom and the Anti-Defamation League, which is a leading anti-hate organization, are both in my trust network. My mom reposts an article that she finds funny despite it having an ethnic slur in it. But the ADL has attached a claim to the article stating that the post is anti-Semitic. And I have said in my preferences, I'd rather not see anti-Semitic material. How might the reader present this information to me? Well, one option is that we can always show everything my mom posts. Another is that we can always not show things that are anti-Semitic. Or there's a median, which is much more interesting, uh, where we flag the content so that I might have a conversation with my mom about how inappropriate that was. We're creating a web of trust where trusted content is shared among all platforms. So we envision there'll be competition among interfaces. Now that you have an API for trusted content, what applications can you envision? I have envisioned this onboarding experience for a reader application where the user explicitly states their preferences. If every user was allowed this explicit ability, how many of us would choose to have lies and propaganda in our feeds? So are we asking users to change their behavior? I don't think so. We've found that people wanna hear from people like themselves and unlike themselves. And in order to have a uh, to come to an understanding, we have to abandon truth in favor of trust. There's a word for this in German that means the fusion of horizons that happens during discourse. And this fusion and understanding can only happen when you can trust who you're talking to. We're releasing our first product in February. To keep up with our progress, please follow Noosphere on Twitter at ExpostFact. Also, check out the folks who I referenced during this talk and who inspire our ideas. Together, we can fix the World Wide Web and make it worthy of Teilhard's vision.